Let's go to the Lord and worship. You guys want to praise God today? Awesome. Look at all these. One. This is, this is just amazing. I love Sunday morning. Yay! Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you. We thank you that we can come together as your family, Lord, as your children, to come praise and worship you. Lord, we pray that you'd be honored today in all that we do. Lord, be it your spirit would be active, Lord, and your word would be powerful. We just love you so much. We give you all the praise. And all God's people said, amen. Our King, come let us bow 
You guys can be seated for just a moment uh, as we enter our time of worship and our offering. If I can have the, uh, the ushers work their way forward, please. Heavenly Father, we just love you. We want to praise you this morning. We want to continue in our worship, Lord, and our giving. And to just thank you, Lord, and remember to, that all we have, Lord, is only because you have bestowed it on us, Lord. Because of your kindness and your, your gentleness, Lord, and your graciousness that you have blessed us to live where we are and to give us the things that we have, Lord, that everything comes from you. And so we just want to continue in worship this morning in this act of worship. Lord, we love you, we praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Darkness, we were waiting without hope, without 
Heavenly Father, you are the King of Kings, Lord. We praise you forever and ever. Lord, we love you so much. We ask that you would be with us as we now prepare to hear your word, Lord, and the things that you have for us to learn this morning. Good morning, church family. Hopefully you're nice and alert and alive. Man, I messed it up already. Alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. So I'm not the only one that messes it up, Pastor Chewy, don't worry. Uh, it's raining outside and it's thundering. And I just think through these times as, man, God is awesome in his creation, isn't he? Like, I hope that really motivates you to remember who created all of this. And it's all for him. So I tell you that story just to start because I got to see my uh, pastoral friend, uh, Pastor Adam, who I told you the story that he would walk outside and we'd be walking along and he would just yell, God made all of this. And so as I was walking in this morning, I was like, I hope he's saying that today as he's probably driving home to Pennsylvania. But um, anyway, I just uh, was, that's an aside note. So if you are new or maybe a long time uh, comer and, uh, but you say, man, I'd really like to get to know the leadership of this church and get to know some of the elders and some of the deacons and some of the teachers. Well, I have great news for you. Next week, we have what we are calling a meet and eat. It's our second time doing this. We'd invite you all to come to that uh, for those that are new. Or again, if you wanna get to know the leadership, please uh, let us know that you're coming by picking up a flyer and then you can let Jake Thomas know or just let us know at the Welcome Center that you're planning on attending. That way we make sure we have enough food but again, this is a great way to get to know the leadership. Uh, and so, like I said, maybe you've been coming for a little bit and you missed out last time because it was really full last time and maybe it'll be really full again this time. Uh, but we really wanna make sure that anyone that wants to come to that, that's next Sunday, right after service, you'll be able to uh, eat with us, fellowship with us, and then hear a little bit about some of the ministries that our leaders are involved in. Um, again, flyers at the Welcome Center and I encourage you to grab one. Speaking of new uh, members, we have two new members, our new uh, family member that's joining us this morning, uh, Derek and Jessica Johnson. Uh, Jessica really wanted to sing a solo. I said, no, you can't do it this morning. No, she didn't, actually. She didn't want me to embarrass her at all, but they're sitting right here in the middle. I invite you to get to know them. <laughs> so sorry, Jessica. I couldn't help but say it. Anyway. Uh, super excited. So if you are interested, by the way, in membership, maybe you go, man, how did they get tied in so fast? We, don't even, we didn't know there was a membership option. Stop at the Welcome Center and you can pick up a membership packet yourself. We would love all of you that are coming regularly, that are a part of our church body, to be members. And I will actually be doing a sermon next month on membership, elders, and deacons. Why are those important in the church body? And I really hope you don't skip that Sunday. Maybe I won't tell you. I'll just show up and be like, we're doing it this Sunday. Um, but I really wanna emphasize, this is not a country club experience. This is a way for us to be a family and to hold one another accountable. So that's, I'll just give you a preview of why I think that's really important that we do that. So come next month, it'll be great. Um, today at 2 p.m., we also have the bell class uh, going. If you weren't here last week, this was announced at uh, 2 p.m. up in the bell choir room. Uh, this is, again, open to anyone that has any interest in our handbells, uh, not just to play our handbells here, but just interested in learning about handbells. So going to this does not mean you're gonna be like performing next week. Please don't hear that. Uh, it's just really, if you have an interest, be here at 2 p.m. Uh, and you can get acquainted with our handbell ministry and those involved in it. Um, finally, we've been talking about how to get in the word like intentional ways. So I've been encouraging you, read the Proverbs, right? That's what I've been calling us to do as a church family. I've also been calling us to memorize God's scripture. Here is another great resource that we have available that's been gifted to us, and it's Today in the Word, all right? So if you, maybe you don't know what Today in the Word is, uh, it's published by Moody Bible Institute, and we have a number of people that work at Moody that are a part of this ministry but not to embarrass them, but Dr. Cook is this month's author. And so, yeah. I love how it says your devotional author, <laughs> Ryan. That's a great way to close that. Um, but I'd encourage you, if you're looking for a way to dig into the word daily, there's one, uh, again, one devotion a day. Just pick it up, read it. It has ways for you to go deeper into the word. And then it has ways for you to intentionally pray. More than just saying, I'm gonna pray, 
it gives you actionable ways and actionable steps and what to pray for. So uh, those are available at the Welcome Center as well, and you might see them around, uh, but please feel free to take one. As we turn to our time of prayer this morning, our missionary for the week is Colleen Deegan uh, and her family uh, who serve Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship right here in the region. If you've ever heard of, how many of you have heard of Inner Varsity? Know what that is? Oh, sweet. A lot of you do, so I don't need to explain. No, I'll explain it anyway. Um, Inner Varsity is a ministry here in the sub, suburban Chicagoland area uh, that ministers to over 25 colleges and universities around Chicago suburbs and Northwest Indiana. Colleen specifically oversees, trains, and supports staff and volunteers in this ministry. Uh, this takes right, right here, right in our backyard at PNW. So Purdue Northwest is one of those locations that uh, we are probably most familiar with. And so we wanna take our time right now intentionally to lift up Colleen, uh, her husband Greg, and their family. They are on vacation this week. I actually reached out to them and then I saw they're on vacation, so she didn't return my phone call, but that's okay. If you're watching this, Colleen, we love you, and we are praying for you today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you would pray with me. Lord, we are so thankful again for this opportunity to lift up our missionaries and the Deegan family. We pray specifically for Colleen and the way she trains and leads and guides others in this ministry, that it would be all about you and for your kingdom and your glory. Thank you again for her family. Lord, we just pray that they had a restful week, that they had an encouraging week, and that their batteries are recharged and they're ready to go. Lord, we look forward to this next school year even and the ministry that'll be taking place on the campuses around the Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana area. So Lord, uh, may you be exalted high in Colleen's life today. May she be growing in you, knowing you better so that she can better equip those around her and those that she ministers to. Thank you again for this ministry with InterVarsity. Now be with us as we turn to the word this morning. May we have open ears and open hearts to what you would say to us. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Jesus, amen. So today's key passage comes from Hebrews chapter six, verses 19 and 20. And you may be saying to yourself, wait, wasn't this last week's key passage? Did Pastor Jeremy just become lazy and forget to change it? No, I didn't, all right? It is the same passage as last week, but I want us to intentionally hear the end of last week's message, and then that's gonna lead us into chapter seven. So I invite you to stand once more to give, reading to, the, uh, to give honor to the reading of God's word. And I want us to, again, remember that we need to anchor our hope in Jesus, our great high priest. So as we read this this morning, have this before us, in Hebrews chapter six, verses 19 and 20, says this, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Jesus, the greatest person, he is the greatest person. We, we are, again, I, I said we're moving forward in the book of Hebrews. We're not forgetting that, but we are moving on to this reminder now and this truth that he is also our great high priest who is interceding on our behalf. How have you done this past week being anchored to our great high priest? That is a question I ask intentionally because it is vital if we are going to grow in our walk with Christ, we have to anchor our soul to him and his word. So I ask this of myself. I actually read Proverbs 14 this morning. I hope you're all proud of me. I did it even before we came. Uh, I don't read it so that you're proud of me, but I read it because, again, I wanna set an example for us to follow. So one of the thoughts I've had often about this is I am, a, I am much more of a night person, or at least I used to be. 9.30 comes, and I'm like, oh, got to go to bed. But I uh, used to be up really late, and I would often say, man, I want to read my Bible before I go to bed. And that, if you do that, if that's your habit, please don't like dislike what I'm about to say, but I'd encourage you, anchor your soul to the Lord in the morning with just something. If you do your deep study at night, great, but start your morning with something from God's Word. I really don't mind what it is. Maybe it's you read the proverb in the morning and then at night you do, um, you know, again, today in the word, right? Free publicity there for, for today in the word. But do something 
where you're intentionally going, I'm gonna start my day anchored to the Lord because that will impact how you interact with everyone in your life, or at least it should. At the very least, it should. So as we think through this, Jesus is interceding for us. If we're going to intercede for others, we need to be anchored to the Lord. Interceding entails going to one party on behalf of another with the purpose of reconciling differences and restoring relationships. We, under, we need to understand first this morning that Jesus is the one doing this for us before God as our great high priest, but we also get to intercede for one another and lift up one another as we go through life. Think through the last time that you interceded for someone, last time you cried out for someone. By the way, we just did this this morning as we lifted up our government officials. That is interceding for others. We cry out for them. We want them to not only just have a good life, reconciling means to be made right with God. That's our heart cry when we lift up others. It's, Lord, we pray that they would come to know you better and then live for you wholeheartedly. That's interceding. That's what we have before us. And today we are going to look at one in Melchizedek. I know some of you have been waiting so long for Melchizedek. We're gonna find out who this mysterious person is. And I I don't wanna let you down here, um, but I may not give you all the answers that you actually want when it comes to Melchizedek. I will do my best, but you're probably gonna leave here today going, man, I wish I knew more about him. So do I, my friends, so do I, all right? So I invite you, if you haven't already, to turn to Hebrews chapter seven, because today we are going to see who this Melchizedek is, why is he mentioned so often in the book of Hebrews as well. And I wanna start by saying, again, all your questions will not be answered, but what we do need to remember is it should point us to Jesus. I'm gonna start right now by saying it's gonna point us to Jesus. We need to remember who he's about. So who is this Melchizedek? I'm gonna give us an introduction into Melchizedek. We're gonna find out a little bit, as much as we can, on who he is. Then we're gonna talk about the greatness of Melchizedek, what made him so great. Why does it say that he's great? We'll talk about that. And then finally, we're gonna close with Melchizedek and the Levitical priests and how all of them were pointing us to something greater. We're pointing us to one who was to come. And for us, we know who that is. And The Sunday school answer is Jesus. You could say it, you don't have to, but that's who we're going towards today. That's who we're after. We're making it all about him. It's all about Christ. Again, don't forget, he's the greatest. So who is Melchizedek? Let's jump right in and we see that he is the king of Salem and priest of God most high. Look at verses one and two of Hebrews seven. It says this, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. So here is what we know. He is king of Salem, priest of the most high God, And he comes to meet Abraham after Abram had just defeated the enemies of Sodom. By the way, the king of Sodom comes to, to him as well with Melchizedek. And they come to talk to Abraham after he had returned from this battle. And we see this account in Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 20. So again, I put these verses on the screen for us because I want us to see this account. Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. Now, if I do not pronounce some of these names correctly, forgive me, Dr. Cook. I, I don't, <laughs> I was looking, up, looking at Hebrews. Uh, but w- just follow along with me to the best of your ability. And if your brain stumbles over what I say, it's because it's your brain, not what I'm saying out loud. All right, so it's going to be great. And we'll, we'll go after it. I, I did rehearse this, but we'll see how it goes. So after his return from the defeat of Kedorlam Laomer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram and Melchizedek both refer to the Lord as God most high. 
Melchizedek, it is said, as, is a priest of the Most High God. That really, start, like, that startles me. So often we read the biblical account and we go, oh, only these people that we read about were the ones that knew God really well. And sometimes we forget that there's a whole nother, like, countries, people serving, living, doing things. So we don't have the whole history account here. And so we see this and I go, man, how did he become priest of God most high? I'm glad you asked that. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I looked into it. There, it's very interesting to this, but what we do know is that Melchizedek desired to honor the Lord. He desired to serve him. And so Melchizedek, again, Abram's coming back from the, from the battle and Melchizedek blesses Abram. So Abram in return gave a 10th of everything to him, which we would call that today a tithe. A tithe. Abraham actually treats Melchizedek as his own priest. What was supposed to be set aside to the Lord, he gives to Melchizedek. This is very important because it demonstrates Melchizedek's priestly and mediatorial superiority to that of the great patriarch Abraham. So I said a lot of big words there. You're like, what does that all mean? Melchizedek is gonna intercede, mediate between God and Abraham. That's really what that means. And yet he's a king and he's a priest. If you understand uh, the prophecies here, he's missing what? Priest, uh, king, he's missing prophet, right? Prophet, priest missing that, so we don't see that he fulfills everything perfectly, nor do we understand that he is even Christ himself, but what we do understand that he's a king of Salem, he's honoring God, he's desiring to serve him, and understanding this, we are given that he is also the king of righteousness, and then the king of Salem, which means the king of peace. This sure sounds like an amazing person. I wish we had more detail. I wish we could go in and dig in deep, deeper into who this is. He is seen as priestly and yet king. And as this comes in Genesis, we might expect to get a genealogy of Melchizedek. Genesis is the book of genealogies. And one reason that it is the, that this is, the Bible is not always going to give us every detail about every person that is living a life to honor God. Even then, we don't get every detail about Jesus. The gospels tell us if everything was written about the life of Jesus, the world could not contain it. So it shouldn't like catch us super off guard that we don't get everything about who Melchizedek, Melchizedek is. And yet that's the stuff we're like, who is this guy? We wanna know more about him. I want more details. And the author of Hebrews reminds us that he has no genealogy to note and there is a good reason of this. And it has to do with who Melchizedek is supposed to remind us of and resemble. Look at verse three with me in Hebrews chapter seven says this, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, I wanna be clear right here. I do not believe that this is a theophany or Christophany instance. And you may be going, what's those words mean? I don't believe this is a opportunity, like Christ appearing in the Old Testament. I don't believe that. Now, some of you may go, I disagree with you. And you can, you can come have a conversation with me afterwards. Uh, please don't hurt me, uh, but that's, that's all, all right? We can have that disagreement, we can have that conversation, but I really believe it's because it gives us the information that he is king of Salem. Well, then why does it say all these things? It's supposed to remind us of Jesus. The author of Hebrews is intentionally going above and beyond to say he has no genealogy to note which again is surprising because Genesis, as I already said, is all about genealogy. If you don't believe me, just look at Genesis 5, Genesis 6, 10, 11, 16, 21, 23, 25, 29, 35, 36, 49, and 50. You might be going, man, that was a lot of numbers. 13 out of the 50 chapters are, have some kind of genealogical reference in that way. That's a lot of history. And yet with Melchizedek, we get none, none of it. Even these genealogies include births, deaths, fathers, mothers, and at times siblings. But when it comes to Melchizedek, as I've already said, we get nothing. And this is important because we understand that having your name in the genealogy account at this point 
would lead to a covenant history of Abraham. He would be in it. He would be part of the covenantal history of Abraham and his offspring. And we see this reminder in Genesis chapter 17, verses one through five. Here's the promise. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. God changed his name. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Melchizedek is not a part of the covenant of Abraham and the Lord. But what we do know, and this is important, what did we see about Melchizedek? He's a king, he's a king of peace. He's a king of righteousness. And is he, he is a worshiper and representative of the most high God. In Old Testament terms, he's an ambassador. He's a priest before. He's there intentionally for a reason. He is pointing us to resemble the Son of God. Remember him, because the Son of God continues as a priest forever. He is eternal. So going back to Hebrews 4.14, we remember this truth. We've already talked about this. But since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. I already asked this question once, but how are you doing at anchoring your soul to the Lord? I hope you don't sit here and go, man, I could really do a better job. I, my prayer is that you're like, hey, I'm doing really well, but I could still do better, right? My prayer is that as a church body, we are succeeding in anchoring our soul to the Lord. As a church bar, body, we are all about him and him alone. Not about our great name, about his great name, and him alone. Let's keep going with our study in Hebrews chapter seven. We're gonna examine the greatness of Melchizedek. And I just said, well, it's not about our great name, but the author of Hebrews does give us this point that says he was great. So let's look at it together. Look at verses four and five of Hebrews chapter seven with me. We'll see that Melchizedek is not only a king, but we get more information on the importance of serving as priest for Abraham. Verse four says this, See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. The blessing and tithe exchange between Melchizedek and Abraham is super important to observe. Melchizedek getting a tenth of the spoils is connected with the Levitical priesthood, which would come much later. Levi hasn't even been born yet, and we get that for information in verse 10 also. But Levi hasn't been born yet. And the author of Hebrews is pointing out how great Melchizedek truly is if Abraham comes to this other person, this foreigner, and says, I'm going to give you the tithe that is supposed to be set aside for the Lord. Israel's patriarch, again, gives him that tithe gives him a tenth, even though he's not related to Abraham and the promise. The tithe they received came from their fellow relatives who were also descendants of Abraham. Le the Levites were set aside. They got no inheritance, no, no promised land for them, but they were to the Lord. How many of you, again, would sign up to be a priest, a Levite? Well, you don't get to sign up. You're just told to do it, all right? Sorry, you're born into the family business, if you will. The tithe they received, though, with the Levites came from those other Israelites. And the Levites then were the intercessors, the mediators, the go-between between, between the Lord and the people of Israel. So we see this command, by the way, given in Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 through 24. It says this, to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute 
throughout your generations and among the people of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, or I've said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Here's what this makes me think of, by the way. If you're a Levite, what are you really hoping is going on with the people of Israel? You're really hoping that they're following the Lord because if they are not following the Lord, what happens? No tithe, no food, no provision for you and your family. If they're just doing what they want, and this was often the time of rebellion, they were not getting their portion, their inheritance. It would be very important to the Levites that they say, hey, follow the Lord, not just for our benefit, but for your benefit as you live pleasing lives to the Lord. Now, I'm sure Ron wants me to give a big sermon right here on tithes and offerings. And I I need to tell you this, it is important for the ministry of the church body. And I'll just put out a, like a, a toss, you know, softball pitch here. If we want things to go well, if we want to keep doing ministry, we need funds to do it. All right. So please don't, it's not about, yeah, amen, Ron. <laughs> but we don't make it about the money. We make it about giving to the Lord to do what we can for him. So think of it, if you, if you again, want to think about it in this terminology, Think of it as Pastor Chewy and I and the elders and deacons, we are being stewards of what's been given to us. In all seriousness, if, if giving just ceased, guess what? This ministry ceases to exist. I'm out of a job at that point. And so please don't hear me go, man, Pastor Jeremy is really wanting us to fill the offering plates. It's not for that reason. It's so that we might even better equip and train one another to live lives holy and pleasing to the Lord. Please do not miss that. The purpose of even talking about tithing is not saying, hey, give us more of your money. No, 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 no. Please don't hear that. It's to do better at honoring the Lord with what he has provided for us. It's all his to begin with. I'm gonna get, I got way ahead of myself here. But let's come back to the passage because the rest of Israel would provide for them as they served on Israel's behalf in God's presence if they're following the Lord. So follow the Lord. That's a key reminder. Please follow the Lord. But Melchizedek is not a descendant, and the author of Hebrews points out that it is clear that Melchizedek then is superior to even the patriarch Abraham. Why don't we sing about Father Melchizedek then? It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, right? (laughs) Father Melchizedek had many sons. I don't think that's gonna work, right? But he's superior, I mean, at least according to the author of Hebrews. And so we need to understand what made him so much superior. We'll look at verses six and seven with us or with me because as we see this inferior and lesser is always going to be blessed by the superior and the greater. Look at verses six and seven with me. It says this, but this man who does not have his descendant from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. You may be going, man, the author of Hebrews really repeats himself a lot. (laughs) He really repeats himself. And I've told us this before. If something is repeated, we need to, like, it's like highlighting it, circle it, make a note of this. Melchizedek is not part of the Israelites. Don't miss that. He is a image of the one who is to come. Melchizedek is not the descendant and therefore is not included in the promise. I think I've said that now five times already. And you may be going, man, Pastor Jeremy's just repeating himself. The author of Hebrews repeats himself intentionally. And it's because we need to understand that key fact there. But he does receive the tithe in Abraham from Abraham. And then he also blesses Abraham. It's not just, hey, give us some money. It's Melchizedek turns and blesses Abraham. The one who is given the promise. In case you forget the promise, Romans 4.13 sums up the promise for us in this way. It says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. By faith, we are saved. It's for everyone. So that's also partly why we sing Father Abraham. 
which that song is now in my head in the background while I'm talking to you and I can't get it out of my head, but that's okay. The promise though, don't miss this, is based on faith. So I'll ask you once more, how are you doing in your faith today? Is your faith living and active? Or are you in this point where you're just saying, I just wanna come to a church and sit here, hear a message and leave? Uh, Ryan Adams so eloquently talked about this in Sunday school this morning, where he used the image of a, of a phone charge. I'm stealing your example, by the way. It was a really good example. Um, but use the example of if you charged your phone on Sunday and then you never used it, which probably, okay, so it wouldn't be a horrible thing if you weren't, you know, but if you didn't receive any phone calls, didn't receive any texts, used it for not what it's supposed to be used for, instead it just sat there as a paperweight. And then you get back to next Sunday and you go, ooh, I gotta charge it again, but you never used it, what's the point of charging it? That's a real important example. Thank you, Ryan, by the way, for that example, because we need to think about that spiritually as well. If all is on Sunday, but we are not utilizing the energy that comes from that, and then we're also not charging it every night by plugging into the source, we are missing out on what we're called to do as Christians. We are missing it. I know, again, I got us a little off topic there, but I need you to hear that. Don't miss out. We are part of that promise. We are heirs by faith. Have an active faith. Don't have a dead faith. Let's, let's get back here, though, to this promise of faith. Because Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. But Melchizedek was outside that promise at this point. So, again, this shows how great he is because tithes go from worshipers through the priest to God. Blessings proceed from God through the priest to the worshipers of God, which is what is being demonstrated here in Hebrews chapter seven. Again, Melchizedek has no genealogy, has no connection, and Abraham on the other side has the promise. Who would we think is the greater? We would assume Abraham, but please don't miss that. The greatest of all is about God. It's all about him. So you may be going, I, I tricked you there maybe. You go, oh, Melchizedek is greater. No, God is the greatest. Honor God in our living. That's what Melchizedek was even doing here. He's honoring God in his living. The facts show then how the order of Melchizedek is going to be different from that of the Levitical priesthood. It also shows that Abraham's ultimate blessedness as seen in Romans 4 is going to come from a Melchizedek-like priest. Can't Melchizedek like doesn't also roll off the tongue, but it's Jesus, all right? The author of Hebrews moves on to show Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood is different. And he starts by looking at their mortality. Look at verse eight of Hebrews chapter seven. It says this, because we have this image of mortal men versus the one living one. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified does our God live? Like, here's a perfect time, right? You thought it was gone, but he is risen. He is risen right? So we don't just serve a dead God. You're like, man, are we gonna make it all the way to Easter and do that all the way? Maybe, I, I said we might. We're on pace, so we're doing it at least once a month. But it's a reminder that we need to hear because he is alive. He is risen. No, oh, thanks, Bradley. All right. The difference, though, between the Levitical priesthood and that of Melchizedek is separated by the fact that the Levites first involved many men. There's many Levites. The tribe of Levi goes on and on. Second, the Levites were mortal. The order of Melchizedek, though, should cause us to think of one man, one man only, and he's the eternal one. The author of Hebrews, again, is not saying Melchizedek is the eternal one and never died, but yet he is saying Again, using that exaggerated language to point us to don't miss out on who this is. This is resembling Jesus. Follow him, make it about him. Don't be so caught up in who this Melchizedek is. Instead, remember that he points us to Christ. Just because we don't see his death in Genesis is not the point. This is clearly pointing us to Jesus. When we hear Melchizedek, we should go, oh, 
I remember him and it should cause me to think how Jesus is interceding for me constantly on my behalf. The one who I had no relation to other than he is the creator of the world and I deserve nothing but death and yet he provided life for me. We follow him. Revelation 1, 17 and 18 reminds us of the truth that Jesus is the one. He is the one who is eternal and living. Verse 17 says this in Revelation 1, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Are you not excited about that this morning? Are you not like, hey, I should live my life completely for this one? That's why I said a few weeks ago, we live for an audience of one. And yet as we live our lives, we want the audience of everyone else to see that one, not us. So we live for his great name because he has the keys of death and Hades. He's locked them up. He's conquered them. He is alive forevermore. He is our eternal great high priest. He is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. He is alive today and is coming soon. So we have the difference of one versus the many. The one versus the many. The mortal versus the eternal. The author of Hebrews is going to point out that there's one more conclusion we need to draw about the relationship of Melchizedek and the Levites. And that, again, has to do with covenantal rep representation. And again, that's a big word. And you may be going, what does that mean? Well, it's a representative of the covenant. <laughs> Did I define it well? Not sure. All right, let's look at verses 9 and 10 and see what this means as we look at the final two verses this morning. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Covenantal representation means this. Descendants are considered to have participated in their ancestors' actions for better or for worse. Abraham's offspring would be multiplied and blessed because Abraham believed God. On the other hand, Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, and because of this disobedient sin enters the world. And Romans 5 makes this very clear. I'm gonna put this big passage on, on the screen for us. Now, you may be going, whoa, that's 12 through 21. It's a big passage, but don't miss the truths that are here. Follow along with me because it's an important cross-reference that we need to understand that yes, we, we see the sin of Adam, but we also see the salvation offered to all through Christ. It's a great passage. If you're, if you're into highlighting or taking notes, Romans 5, 12 through 21 is a key cross-reference for this. Note it, please. All right, so let's look at this starting in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those sinning, whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift, free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. 
so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me simplify this for us. All generations after Adam are guilty sinners deserving of death. But God, but God, it's all about him. It's all about Christ. The one and only true living God provided a way for us to be made right with him, our creator through Jesus, the one perfect one. Salvation is found in no other name under heaven except his name. Do not miss that. Do not confuse that. The world will try and tell you, hey, everyone who's good will make it. Just be good enough in your own. Or just believe whatever you want to believe because it doesn't matter. It matters. It is a free gift. But if you never accept the free gift, you're missing it. In the same way, once you receive the free gift, use it. Use it. Share it with others. Give it away as often as you can. By the way, you can duplicate that over and over again. It's like you have unlimited gifts to share with anyone because salvation is for everyone. So don't miss that. Please don't miss that. And I'm, Again, I'm speaking this to myself. All that we have talked about with Melchizedek should remind us of our eternal great high priest. So how does this apply to us today then? How do we take Melchizedek and who he is with Abraham? How do we make this apply to our lives today? How is it relevant? Who cares who Melchizedek is? No, don't miss that. Don't miss it. He pointed us to Jesus. And this is the conclusion for this morning. Melchizedek points us directly to the Savior. Jesus is our Savior. He's the one and only So when we hear Melchizedek, Melchizedek, man, I've stumbled over that word so many times. I'm glad when we're going to get past Melchizedek. (laughs) Unfortunately, we're going to have a few more weeks with him. It's going to be okay. It's going to be great. But Melchizedek points us to Jesus. Don't miss that. And here's another part. Honor God in our giving. Honor God in our giving. It's all his. There is more than a tenth offering that's supposed to be given, by the way. We're not going to get into that today, but be generous in our giving, not just to the church, but to everyone. When we talk about loving our neighbor, loving our neighbor is meeting our needs above our own, meeting their needs above our own. Live generously. Don't live greedily. Live generously, live generously because it's all his to begin with. Stewardship is the word there. Steward well. Care for it well, for the Lord's glory. And then finally, rejoice in our eternal high priest. Celebrate. Give him eternal praise in everything that we do. Make it all for his great name. So as we sing, again, I've said this often, who cares what the people around you think? Even if you have the worst voice ever, it doesn't matter. Sing for the Lord. Sing for the audience of one. And friends, if you're here today and you're going, man, I I wish they would not sing that loud. No, join them. Sing louder. Out sing one another in that way. Not to bring glory to ourselves, but because we say, Lord, I want you to hear how awesome you are. You're worthy of it. I want to make this for you. And so maybe here's the other side. Maybe you say, well, I I don't like singing out loud. And I understand that. Makes you uncomfortable. Okay. Friends, your heart should be overflowing, though, with abundant joy, where you just go, I might not be singing it as loud as Pastor Jeremy wants me to, but my heart rejoices with him. My heart is crying out, and it's just right there with him. I may not do it outwardly, but inwardly I'm there. So here's, take those steps, right, in faith. Maybe you say, I don't even know if my heart's ready to rejoice today because of the circumstances of this life that hold me down. I get it. Circumstances are hard. Um, The sin that so easily entangles us, it can really hold us down. And it can really keep us from rejoicing. But James reminds us, rejoice always. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I wish it just said the heart, like, you know, whenever you face those big trials, that's when you consider it joy. But it says it all. 
trials, all hardship, all circumstances, we are to come to the Lord. We're going to close with this reminder from Hebrews chapter seven, verse 26 through 28, because this is our savior. And you may be going, well, that's next week's passage. We started with the previous week's passage for today. We're gonna end with this reminder. And I want us to cling and I want us to anchor our soul in this reminder that this is the greatest of all time. He is our great high priest, Jesus. He is our confidence and we're gonna anchor our soul to him. So we're gonna do our best to honor him this morning. So I'm gonna invite you to stand with me and read this out loud. You may be one of those people also that go, I don't like reading because I'll struggle with the words. Who cares? Just read it out loud with all our heart. Even if you get off the, 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 you know, the time, there's a timing as we read together congregationally. Friends, if you're just like running through it, run through it, right? Like just read it out loud. It's okay. Um, we won't embarrass you and say, hey, who was in that pause or anything like that, all right? <laughs> just read it to the best of your ability. So again, anchor our soul to this. Let's read these three verses out loud together, starting in verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. He offered up himself. He is our sacrifice. Seek forgiveness in the Lord. It's all about him. Would you pursue him greatly this week and represent him well as you live for that audience of one? Let me close this in prayer. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful again that we can study the book of Hebrews, that we can see this person, Melchizedek, and we're gonna see next week how he's compared to you, Lord. Thank you again that you are our savior. Thank you again that you provided salvation in no other name but your own. As you came to earth, lived a sinless life, and died for our sins that we might know you. Lord, I do pray that if anyone is hearing this message today, whether here at the church or online or uh, watching it later, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation if they don't know you personally as their savior that we would accept that free gift. Lord, thank you again for the free gift of salvation. Lord, for those of us that have accepted it, Lord, I pray that we would use it, that we would have an act of faith, that we would be in your word daily and then desiring to point people to you. Not to us, Lord, but to you. So thank you again for this time you've given to us in your word. Lord, may we be faithful stewards of all that you've given to us for your great name and your great kingdom. We pray all these things now in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Can't wait.
Is he worthy, church? Father, you are worthy. You are holy and righteous. What an amazing God you are. We thank you for our time together today. Lord, we praise you. We give you all the glory. All God's people said. Amen. Go in peace, church family. We love you. Have a great week.